Welcome back to Get Fit Guy. Kevin Don here with a significant diatribe in response to some listener comments and emails I received last week. Regular listeners of the show will know that I don't see fitness as what we do in the gym a couple of times a week just for the goal of checking off a box marked physical activity. Instead, I see fitness as everything that we can do to move the needle from sickness to wellness and developing an understanding of ourselves as humans. I think it's our responsibility to ourselves as we navigate our world to have at least a basic understanding of self-maintenance, both in terms of our physicality, but also our mindset and the emotional factors which help influence our decisions. After all, there's 168 hours in a week. You might spend 5 to 10 hours of that in a gym, so what we do in the other 94% of the week is always going to be more impactful on our fitness than gym time is. In episode 590 of the show, I discussed how to resist the aging process with strength training. In case you missed that episode, I really suggest you go have a listen. It's packed with useful and irrefutable facts. But in the meantime, I'll recap it as a background to this week's rant. As we age, we're all undergoing a process that affects all matter in the known universe. As time progresses, we all move from a situation of order to disorder and disarray. This is a fundamental and maybe the most robust law in nature, that in a closed system, entropy can never decrease, it only increases. In a human organism, that disarray and entropy comes in many forms, but it's mainly expressed as metabolic syndromes. Most notably, sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass, and osteopenia, which is a loss of your bone mineral density. Both of these can be mitigated by intentional and deliberate intervention. In terms of sarcopenia, we know that muscles, ligaments, and tendons are what we consider soft tissues in the body, and we know that soft tissues resist a force called tension. Tension is when our bodies are being pulled longer and being stretched out. We then contract our muscles to resist this, and the act of resisting tension enables the soft tissues to become stronger. Think about this example of tension acting on the body, carrying a grocery bag in one hand. The arm holding the groceries is being pulled down by the load, and you resist this by pulling in the opposite direction. If you didn't resist, then you wouldn't be holding the bag because it would still be on the ground. If there's no tension, muscles can't create an adaptation. This is why lifting some load is crucial to gaining strength. You cannot resist against nothing. Next up is osteopenia. This relates to your bone mineral density. We have evidence that bone remodels itself according to the stress it is placed under. If we decrease the stress, bone mineral density decreases. This is one of the major reasons astronauts weigh much less upon returning to Earth and have to work incredibly hard on training in space. This adaptation to stress is called Wolf's Law. It's a law because it's a rule that always happens when these conditions exist. It's not a debatable situation because it's not called Wolf's Possibility. Bones get stronger by the force of compression. This is where hard tissue, the bones, Resist being crushed top-down by a load. Think about Indiana Jones propping open a descending tomb door by wedging a femur bone under it. That's compression. We can create this with things like a barbell squat, which compresses the whole torso and the legs. Now, there are, of course, other metabolic syndromes that affect us as we age, such as insulin resistance and increases in visceral fat. Training interventions can also be useful in these situations and will be discussed in future episodes. So, why am I recapping all of this? Well, a listener noted in response to my recent episode, number 617, on squat variants that, as a 50-something, my knees make the squat almost impossible. Now, I understand and respect each person's reality, and how important it is to feel heard and validated. But by the same token, I have a significant community of listeners here on Get Fit Guy, 
and I have a duty of care to ensure that I get them training safely and enjoying lifelong fitness and health. Therefore, I have to pour water on this notion that the squat is almost impossible because the structures of one's knees have hit the half century, because that is simply untrue. Of course, as noted above, we're all aboard a ride on the Entropic Express, from which we cannot disembark. Cellular processes mean that we will all have some wear and tear. But being in our 50s, or any other arbitrary age, is not a defining factor. And as far as advice goes, on both a subjective and objective level, I would call that catastrophizing. Across a whole population of half-centenarians, if they were all to say, I'm 50, and therefore my knees are now going to reject a natural range of human motion, the healthcare system would be completely unable to cope, overloaded, and go into meltdown. Now, this is not to say that we aren't affected by aging, and that there are not factors, genetic ones, arthritis, chronic or acute injuries, but what I can say is that because we adapt to external stresses, we also adapt to a lack of external stress. A good maxim here is use it or lose it. It's very often the case that as soon as we catastrophize and stop using our bodies, we have a worse outcome. I would encourage everyone, irrespective of their age, to learn how to express themselves physically through the movement patterns and degrees of freedom discussed in earlier episodes. Hitting a chronological landmark is not a meaningful metric of your ability to perform a gross motor skill. I'll leave this with a quote from my own favorite coach, Mark Ripito, who says, Humans are built to move. We evolved under conditions that required daily intense physical activity. And even among individuals with lower physical potential, that hard-earned genotype is still ours today. The modern sedentary lifestyle leads to the inactivation of the genes related to physical performance. Attributes that were once critical for survival and which are still critical for the correct, healthy expression of the genotype. The genes are still there. They just aren't doing anything because the body is not being stressed enough to cause a physiological adaptation requiring their activation. The sedentary person's lungs, heart, muscles, bones, nerves, and brain all operate far below the level at which they evolved to function and at which they still function best. Now, let's go on to a listener email that I received this week. Hello, just finished listening to your No Pain, No Gain episode. I find myself having the opposite problem. No exercise, more pain. Now that I'm on the wrong side of 50, if I don't move regularly, I'm experiencing stiffness and soreness. There are many mornings, it's extremely hard to get out of that warm bed to go swim, especially when the knees creak and the back is screaming from being so immobile. Do you have any exercise suggestions to keep my body from complaining every morning? My doctor says I'm healthy. Just getting up there with some amount of discomfort is expected. Should I back off swimming and switch to more yoga for flexibility? What's a good workout routine to keep the body, mostly knees and back, from complaining when the morning alarm goes off? Thank you, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for the email. I think that everyone listening could benefit from a comprehensive reply to this. Now, as I just discussed, age itself isn't a metric on the state of our bodies or our ability to perform a task. Just ask my 60-year-old karate coach, who still outperforms me at martial arts, who cycles hundreds of miles every week, and not long ago, raised money for charity by swimming from England to France. Or so ran of fines who at 65 years old climbed Mount Everest, and at 71 years of age ran a 156-mile foot race through the Sahara Desert, including completing two marathons in one day in temperatures reaching 122 degrees. Now, that being said, as part of a closed system, we are subject to that entropic process. As we age, 
our joints produce less synovial fluid, which is the natural joint lubricant, and cartilage, which cushions the joints from impact and from friction, gets thinner, and also the ligaments in the joints themselves lose collagen and shorten. This makes you feel stiffer and less flexible. So it makes sense that you feel stiff and sore in the morning because we're lacking in joint lubrication and our ligaments are stiffer. It takes time to get the engine running and get warmed up. Now, as you've noticed, these symptoms go away when you've been up and about. The best noticing you've had that is if you don't move regularly, you experience more stiffness and soreness. This alone tells us the best outcome is to move. Humans are designed to move, and the body, although a bit of an oversimplification, is a system of pulleys and levers, all designed to move us through our environment in 360 degrees. Sadly, because things like morning stiffness are an unavoidable side effect of aging, can't say I have any specific training protocols that will help here. I think you hit the nail on the head by recognizing the importance of exposure to movement. I would say that the best way to get that stiffness and soreness to go away is to get moving as early as possible on waking. That may indeed look something like yoga or what we call CARS, which is controlled articular rotations, which take the joints through a full range of movement in a deliberate and controlled manner. Look out for an episode on CARS soon. Now, regarding swimming versus yoga for strength and flexibility, not sure about that. I would encourage everyone to take the data I've given and make objective choices. Now, we know that we want a full range of motion around joints in different degrees of freedom, forwards, backwards, sideways, rotating, etc. And to build muscle strength, we want some tension. And for bone density, we want compression. Because when we're swimming, the water is supporting us, there isn't any meaningful tension or compression. And we don't have a way to incrementally increase the external loading to create a strength adaptation. So I'd say swimming is limited. Similarly, we tend to either swim forwards or backwards. So we're lacking exposure to multiple degrees of freedom in space. Yoga is great for exposing your joints to varied degrees of flexion and extension through multiple joints through the body. It's great for isometric strength because you're holding positions and amazing for core strength, which is vital to anchoring all our other movement patterns to. But again, we don't see a large number of degrees of freedom because whilst it utilizes many movement patterns, it's predominantly taking place on one spot. We also don't have a way to build non-isometric strength because we don't have an incrementally loadable external object. So my advice would be to have a look at things this way. What degrees of freedom in space are involved? What motor patterns are involved? Does it permit the development of strength via external loading? And does it have elements of compression and tension? Find something that you enjoy participating in and that hits as many of those metrics as possible and you'll be good to go. I hope this week has managed to clarify the importance of strength training, and I'll leave you with another good quote. Strong people are harder to kill than weak people, and more useful in general. If you have a question for me that you'd like answered, please check out the Get Fit Guy Facebook page, where you can leave me a comment, or send me an email to getfitguy at quickanddirtytips.com. Get Fit Guy is a Quick and Dirty Tips podcast. Thanks to the team at Quick and Dirty Tips, Adam Cecil, Morgan Christensen, Holly Hutchings, and Davina Tomlin. Our intern is Cameron Lacey. And I'm your host, Kevin Don. If you have a question for me, leave me a voicemail at 510-353-3104, send me an email at getfitguy at quickanddirtytips.com, or send me a comment on the Facebook page. For more information about the show, visit quickanddirtytips.com or check out the show notes in your podcast app. 